Wow. Hey, good morning. This is Joel Walsman. I'm the CEO and Master Electrician of Jefferson Electric. I'm at my house today. This home was built in 1938. I've lived here less than two years and uh, I've been correcting electrical issues. A majority of the electrical, other than just little spot items in the kitchen, have not been addressed. So I'm gearing up for a whole house rewire and I'm going to invite you into that so that you can see and understand the process and details and codes and practices associated with rewiring an entire home or a portion thereof. But for today, I've got a back door right here. This comes right into our mudroom. We park our cars outside and I need to add a lighting control. In my opinion, in my humble opinion, every outdoor security light or convenience light needs to be on some method of automatic control. That's not a code, that's an opinion, but automatic control so that it's on at dark, off either at midnight or at, at dawn, whatever the case may be to satisfy your security concerns, but a switch, a manual switch like this to operate an outdoor light, it's a no-go. I flip that switch two or three times a day. I've got more important things to put my brain space toward. It's like the Steve Jobs uniform. Like this is one of the most successful people in the history of mankind and he wears jeans and a black shirt as a uniform every day. Nothing glamorous. It's so that he can free up brain space for more important tasks. This switch right here, it's, <laughs> it takes too much brain space. It's like 10 seconds a day. That's too much. Every outdoor light on an automatic means of control. In this case, I'm going to be installing an Intermatic time clock. And uh, I'm not super selective about what kind of device goes in for automatic means of control, but I've got one of these at the front door, so this will match, so it maintains simplicity of operation. And then it's an easy override button, and I can change the schedule if I want to. I've actually got a carriage house and a renter on the property, so if my light is interfering with their sleep, I can have it shut off at 10 p.m. if I want, and I can control the routine. Um, so this, this, this is my preferred method. It, they're like $35 to $55 on Amazon. A link in the description. Um, but this is what I'm going to use today. I've got a Honeywell programmable time clock here as well. Um, and it's really six and one half dozen or the other to me. I just want to free up that brain space. That's my number one objective here. So this is the switch in question. I've got my battery charger plugged in here. I'm going to take that out. And I'm always going to test my, my situation first. Test what's going on so that I understand if there's a pre-existing issue. That's really important to me because I've come to the final conclusion and there is a pre-existing condition that I was not aware of. I'm going to run into issues on the troubleshooting side and I want to be looking for the issue when I pull this apart based upon the diagnosis that I get. Uh, so I've got an open ground and a 123 volts. See, this is a really nice um, digital reader and that it's going to give me more information than your typical uh, dummy plug-in tester. Uh, I love this thing to pieces. Link in the description. This is, this is 21st century stuff right here. Um, so an open ground, that means this prong right here does not, is not served by a ground. I'm not entirely surprised by that. Like I said, a 1938 home grounding to my knowledge, and I wasn't in the trade, I wasn't looking up codes from 1938, was not a thing. Grounding was not a thing in 1938. So I'm gonna encounter issues every time I pull something apart in this house until that complete rewire has taken place. Okay, <laughs> well, let's shut off the circuit and let me show you. I, I, there's already an issue going on here that I can see and I know exactly why it's, why it's the case. Uh, so let's make sure power's off. There it is, now it says open hot. Well, that means the power is off. You see these T20 Spax screws? The previous owner here loved the dude. He took such good care of this house, but he was a carpenter. And this is hallmark of a carpenter right here. Um, these are like uh, effectively um, high strength, high shear strength screws for like deck building, construction, and they are holding this receptacle and wall plate. Uh, that's just, it's way overkill, but also now we have a sharp threaded screw inside the electrical box that potentially could abrade a wire and cause a short. So let me see if I can correct that at the same time. 
Look at that. That is not a plate screw. We got code issue, <laughs> all kinds of screws here. That one's stripped, another T20 Spax. Let's see if we can get, get in there. Ooh. And <clears throat> looks like some number two squares. Tell you what, if you're working on a project and you can utilize one kind of screw for that entire project, you're gonna speed yourself up, speed the next guy up, not having to change bits back and forth. I understand how that stuff comes, comes about, but <clears throat> one type of fastener. All right, so the other code violation that's taking place here is boxes, electrical boxes, must be flush with the finished surface if the finished surface is combustible. In this case, it's wood. It is combustible. And the box is recessed back inside the wall. So check out, that's just a standard receptacle with a night light, which is cool. Right inside the back door, um, steps going up, steps coming down. I think that's a great feature. It's got its own photo cell built into that. So if you cover that little center bit right there, you block the light and these lights come on. It's a really, really great device. I recommend them. I've put these in uh, the kids' bathrooms as built-in night lights that don't get unplugged or lost. Lost. Whoa! Hello. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot going on here. The box is recessed and offset inside the wall by about two inches. We've got the old 1938 wiring. I'm gonna be real careful on that so I don't crack the insulation or break off some of the copper. Then this newer wiring, these are actually just pigtails going back into the box. So what I'm gonna need, and I don't have one today, but what I am gonna need is a two gang um, extension ring to slide in there and effectively extend the fire rating of the box out to the finished surface. So that's why the receptacle's not grounded. See that? There's, there's not a ground wire. I might be able to tap to the box and pick up a ground. Well, I'll use my digital multimeter to take a look. Let's get some light in there. So this is what we're looking at. We've got the, uh, the wood facade, about three quarter inch, and then we've got about an inch and a quarter gap there to the box extension. And then you can see this this hole right here, that's the face, face, the original face of the original box, which is right there. And this is all embedded in the masonry. So that used to be the finished wall. That's the plaster, that green right there. That used to be the finished wall, and this was overlaid at some point. So in my whole house rewire, I'm gonna, I'm gonna consider this simply an investigative detour. Um, I'm still gonna put in my astronomical time clock, but uh, I've gotta address this. Here's another issue going on. See, uh, see how that joint was made? The conductor is so long, stripped so far back, that now we've got some bare hot copper there, so I'm gonna address that. I'm gonna try to be real ginger, and then I'm gonna use this hole up here as my grounding hole. I'm gonna tap that to a 1032, and I bet I'm gonna pick up a ground that I can then connect to my devices, so at least I'm providing some more safety to the end user, whoever's interacting with um, these two devices. So take a look at the gap here. That. Uh, that's a code violation. My electrical box should be flush with my finished surface. I'm allowed uh, a quarter inch differential if it's a non-combustible surface like plaster or drywall, but uh, this big gap and this wooden facade, I really need a um, box extender to be slipped in there, two gang box extender to extend the fire rating of the box out to the finished surface, the mounting surface of the devices where the plate will rest. So. Uh, all kinds of things to fix here. So I've got my tap set here. This is uh, a tap set that's drill tap combination and it provides all the common tap sizes for electrical devices. I'm utilizing a 1032 which is the size of my ground screw and I'm going to utilize that hole right up there. I'm going to go real nice and easy. Very low speed, low torque. I don't want to snap off my tap, try to keep it true, 
these taps are fairly fragile, uh, especially the smaller sizes like the 632s. So now that hole right there is tapped for my ground screw. Could really get wrapped around the axle about whether that hole was UL listed in the original box for, uh, for grounding of the box. You know what? It wasn't. I can already tell you that. It wasn't. But is it functionally going to serve the purpose? And is it going to be safer than what I found it? Particularly for personnel and shock, shock safety? Absolutely. 100%. So I'm going to do it. So I've taken my number 12 ground wire. I've wrapped it around my ground screw. It's a number two square drive or Robertson. And get a get a pre-bend on it back into that hole get it snug down I'm working with old stuff here so snug not death grip I don't want to strip it out shear it off And really the electrical tape is, it's just gonna provide um, a sort of shock safety. And so I'm not necessarily feeling the need to put that back on there. I did need to take it off though in order to get to that ground screw. So that's, you know, that's a little short. That is so far back in there. I thought I cut it plenty long. So I'm gonna pivot my concept just a bit and I'm gonna pigtail my grounds off of this, so then I'll have one ground going to each device. Let's take a second to do that right. So I've got my two shepherd's hooks here. I'm gonna pre-twist those onto my ground conductor. At this point, this conductor is my main ground, and yes, I worked in the rain. Look at that, those things just ugly, ugly, ugly. Rusty, a little bit stiff. So I'm gonna do my pre-twist. All about the pre-twist. I really am, guys. Not everybody agrees, but I really am. Use my appropriately sized wire nut. All right. I'm actually gonna take just a little bit of that twist out of there. That one's for that, that one's for that. All right, let's just hold off on that for a second. And let's get this, see if we can get this corrected. I'm kind of nervous about this. Whenever your wires are that short and you start messing with them, whoo buddy, sometimes it gets ugly. You know what? Word to the wise. I said it out loud and it made me stop and think. I don't like it, but as long as it withstands a tug test, I'm gonna be careful about how I tuck it back in there, but I am gonna leave it. Because if, if that copper's been over manipulated and that breaks off right there, three inches behind the work surface. Oh my goodness, that's ugly. All right, now onto my switch, bringing some focus to subject matter. I'm gonna mark what I've got going on here. I'm gonna use a little flag of red electrical tape. Could you could use black, blue, any, any hot color. Probably wouldn't use white or green or gray. But I'm just gonna identify my conductors in case anything gets confusing in the final analysis. So they've got a white wire with the hot conductors coming to the brass terminal or hot terminal and they've got our neutral with a black conductor and that's the one that I don't want to disrupt. So the color coding is incorrect. Wild. Just never stops. Number one square drive. A lot of people try a number two Phillips on these device terminals. But man, that number one square drive, it doesn't actually come standard with electrical screwdriver kits typically, but it is gorgeous. Look at this, here's another issue. Two conductors under one terminal. That really should not be. Every terminal has a rating and that terminal is not rated for two conductors. So pigtail like we've done on the, the grounds and bring the two conductors to their desired destinations. All right, here's my new switch. Now, a couple thoughts on this. One, you can get some smart switches for a lesser cost. What I like about this is this is not just a simple time clock. It is 
an astronomical time clock. So I'm going to set the latitude and the time zone, and then this baby's going to track track with that. So daylight savings, uh, adjustments in sunrise, sunset, all that stuff already baked into this, and it's got the intelligence that I'm going to set it and forget it. There's a color coding going on here. Let's see if we can. Well, let's talk about ratings real quick. This is a 120 volt switch, operates on the 50 or 60 hertz frequency. 60 is the US, 50 I believe is uh, Europe, potentially all of Europe. 50 amp general, 15 amp general purpose, 8 amp tungsten, 15 amp inductive, 5 amp electronic ballast one horsepower motor. So those are the limitations for the type of load, um, not just light, but also other types of loads that you can put on this switch. In this case, we've got one 14 watt LED. Um, I think that would fall into the electronic ballast. So we're at fractions of an amp, uh, like uh, one tenth of an amp. So no concerns there about the load associated. We've got a ground, neutral, and then probably, we'll check the instructions, but probably a hot and a switch leg. And this would be for a three-way configuration is my guess. But let's just confirm those color codes because it's not marked on the device itself. So some of you are not gonna like this. Check it out. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually pick up, because my neutral connection is way back there. Remember, color, color on the device, on the wire to the device is incorrect. I'm gonna pick up my neutral connection off of the receptacle and that is actually only non-permissible in the event of a multi-wire branch circuit. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this, my friends, is not a multi-wire branch circuit. So that's where I'm getting my neutral, right there. Again, this is a precaution to avoid opening a rat's nest and killing power to part of the house. Now, uh, you might be asking, do I need to reset this time clock when the power goes out? No, it has a non-user replaceable battery. It's gonna make some people nervous, but it will restore, uh, will maintain its settings during a prolonged power outage. This red conductor is only for multi-location, three-way switching. So I'm gonna cap that safely in case it becomes energized. Black is my hot. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna take my two hots that I flagged here, to this guy, and I'm gonna very gingerly open them up. And this hot, here's another issue. We've got 14 gauge conductor right here. It's a 20 amp circuit. Should not be, should not be. 14 gauge conductors, 15 amp breakers. That's the way to do it. So I'm gonna be real easy. I'm not gonna over, overly twist that. Ah, it's not even holding itself in place. I'm gonna use a slightly larger wire net. See that? I don't want that. I'm gonna take my strands, twist them to the right, put my stranded conductor in there last. And it's kind of clunky, kind of awkward. Get it all together. And all right, I'm, I'm feeling my conductors with my left hand right now to see if one of them starts to get pushed out of the equation instead of drawn into the wire nut. And I don't want to over tighten my wire nut because what I can actually do is bulge. And I'm going to show you this. I can bulge my wire net and I can actually punch through the end of it with a solid conductor if I, if I just really crank that down too much. All right, that's good. Don't overdo it. These are old tenuous wires. I'm gonna bring my switch leg up here, make that connection. I'm gonna visually inspect my connections because I've got stranded wires and what I could have is a strand sticking out of that wire net. Okay, so that's kind of busy, it's kind of messy, but everything has a destination, everything makes sense. Back it up and watch it again if you're having questions. Drop a comment below. Um, one of the things I will say is there's so much smart home technology out there right now, and I'm not sure that presently there's a clear industry leader 
and high quality, user friendly, single app, smart home technology for the general Joe. And so if you've got an opinion, I would love to hear it in the comment section below because we generally steered away from it and let consumers, what we've done is we've steered away from making a strong recommendation to our customers and we've let consumers sort that out. We'll help them with the technology of their choice but when they make that decision, it becomes their responsibility. If they don't like the functionality, if uh, software updates, it's glitchy, it's not being well supported, they're not pointing fingers at us. And right now, it's just all over the place. So I've chosen to defer that responsibility to the consumer. All right, time to carefully tuck things back in there. It's not perfect, but it's a little better than what we found it. We're now grounded at our devices. I'm not gonna get too far before I turn power back on and just check stuff. Wow, you know what? I am gonna use their screws and put it back in just like it was. I'm gonna make sure none of my wires are up where they're gonna con be contacted by those screws. So I need to keep tucking. When you're placing wires into a box, shove is always a bad word. <laughs> it's busy, it's crowded. I've got the protective liner on there. I'm gonna keep it on there until I'm done. <laughs> so the outlet is good now and it is grounded. That green light, beautiful, beautiful. Gonna, I've got a new wall plate. That's something that's commonly overlooked in an installation like this because you're thinking so much about the device and the mechanics that some of the, the basic elements like a new wall plate to accommodate the double decora gets overlooked. At this point, I'm gonna take my gloves off because I don't wanna get anything smudgy or smeary as I program my new switch. What's happening there is that screw is hitting the wood because things aren't right with the box. That is okay for now. It's a pretty minute aesthetic issue. Pending whole house rewire. So now I've got an override for off and on. Let's check the light, make sure it's working. Sweet but it won't change the schedule by overriding it. So right now the light is off. It is responding to the switch. Beautiful. It's gonna be a dusk to dawn. That means it's all on, on all night, every night. Uh, as soon as it starts getting dark out there, my family will have light to come inside. Subscribe to Electric Pro Academy for real skills to make real money. And if you're interested in more videos about older homes or simpler switch replacements, check out our library and click here for the next video.